Hello, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Atom, and today we're going to be reading Cell Division. This is a lab manual in Unit 5. Section 1, The Blueprint for Life. Catching a Blue Lobster. Wayne Nickerson was fishing off the coast of Massachusetts when he caught a lobster. This wasn't a typical lobster, however. Most lobsters are usually a greenish brown color until they're cooked, when they turn bright red or orange. The lobster caught by Wayne Nickerson was bright blue. Bright blue lobsters are rare. Only one out of every two million lobsters is blue. The lobster Wayne caught was so unusual that Wayne's wife Jan named it Le, which is French for blue. The couple wants to donate the lobster to the New England Aquarium. The unusual color of the lobster is a physical trait. Traits are the physical and behavioral characteristics of an organism. A lobster's crawling to move around is an example of a behavioral trait. Traits can be passed down from parents to offspring, which is called heredity. Traits that are passed down are called inherited traits. Environmental factors can shape inherited traits. For example, height is an inherited trait that is determined by our genes. However, poor nutrition, an environmental factor, can stunt growth. Learned traits are those traits that are developed during your lifetime, so they are not inherited. Language is an example of a learned trait in humans, as is the ability to ride a bike. Just because your parents can ride a bike does not mean that you are born knowing how to ride a bike. You must first learn how to do it. Recipes for life. The reason some lobsters are blue begins with their DNA. DNA is the instruction manual for how the cell should look and what it should do. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. An organism's DNA is located in almost every cell and the DNA is identical in each cell within an organism. DNA has been called the blueprint for life because it, it contains the instructions for building all living things and ensuring organisms function properly. DNA is a polymer, which means it is a large molecule made up of many smaller molecules bonded together in a repeating chain-like pattern. DNA is made up of smaller molecules called nucleotides. A nucleotide is itself made up of three types of molecules, a phosphate, a five carbon sugar, and a nitrogen containing base. There are four nitrogen bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. DNA gets its name from the sugar molecule, which is called de deoxyribose. DNA has two strands that wind around each other, which make the DNA molecule twist like a spiral staircase called a double helix shape. The sugar and phosphate molecules make up the sides of the ladder and the bases pair up to form the rungs. The base pairs follow a predictable pattern. A always links to T and C always links to G. Because of this, if you know the sequence of nucleotides on one side, you know the sequence of nucleotides on the other side. The blue color of this lobster is a physical trait of the lobster. DNA is a polymer made up of smaller molecules. The specific order of nucleotides determines the, me the meaning of the information encoded in that part of the DNA molecule in the same way that the specific order of letters determines the meaning of a word. DNA is broken up into smaller segments called genes. A gene is a specific pattern of nucleotides that produces a specific protein or set of proteins, which in turn codes for a trait. In other words, each gene contains a specific structure of DNA that provides instructions for how to make one or a few related proteins. Each protein is a chain made up of compounds called amino acids. Amino acids are primarily made up of the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, although other elements are sometimes found. 
After a protein or set of proteins is built according to the instructions in the gene, the completed protein is released to do its job in the cell. Everything that takes place in an organism is either made of proteins or is the result of an action caused by a protein. Proteins build the structures of the organism, specifically its cells, tissues, and organs. Proteins also determine how an organism looks and even sometimes how an organism behaves. For example, proteins make up the physical structures of lobsters, including their internal structures, such as their cells, and their external structures, such as their claws. Proteins also determine the exact color of the lobster. The structure of the protein often affects how the protein functions. For example, the proteins that help you digest food are structured in such a way that they can break down particular food molecules. Genes, which code for specific proteins, which determine an organism's trait. Genes, chromosomes, and traits. Genes are located on chromosomes. A chromosome is a thread-like structure of DNA and protein found in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Each chromosome is made up of a single DNA molecule, and it holds hundreds or thousands of genes on it. The genes are located on the chromosomes in a very specific way. Because of this, if scientists know where one gene is located, they can find it on anyone's chromosomes. Different kinds of organisms have different numbers and shapes of chromosomes. For example, prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus, so their DNA is spread throughout the entire cell. Most bacteria have one or two circular chromosomes. Plants and animals have linear chromosomes that are arranged in pairs. Fruit flies have four pairs of chromosomes, while lobsters have 50 pairs of chromosomes. In humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes found in the nucleus of each of your cells, except for red blood cells, which don't have a nucleus. Chromosomes are in pairs because one chromosome is inherited from each parent. Both chromosomes in the chromosome pair contain genes that code for the same proteins. These are called alleles. An allele is a form of the same gene that has small differences in the sequence of DNA base, bases. For example, one allele might have the instructions for proteins that would result in blue eyes, while another allele might have the instructions for proteins that would result in brown eyes. Each parent contributes one allele. So here's a diagram of a cell, a chromosome, and a gene. Alleles code for the same protein. Mutations. The path from a gene to a protein is very complex, and there are many steps along the way. Sometimes the instructions in the DNA can become changed in the process. Any permanent change in the DNA is called a mutation. Genetic mutations that are inherited from a parent are called heredity, hereditary mutations. Other mutations are not hereditary. These are called acquired mutations, and they occur in the DNA of individual cells at some time during a person's life. They can be caused by environmental factors or a mistake made as DNA copies itself. We'll explore this idea more in the next section. While some genetic mutations are very rare, others are common in the population. Many of the common mutations cause the normal variations among people, including hair and eye color. Other mutations don't have any effect on you. These are called neutral or silent mutations because they don't change the expression of any gene. The blue lobster's color is an example of a mutation that is harmful to the organism. In this particular mutation, the genes that code for color cause the lobster cell to make too much of one particular protein, which makes the lobsters that unique blue color. Very few blue lobsters survive in the wild because their bright blue color makes them stand out against the ocean floor. This makes it easy for predators to spot them and eat them. In contrast, the brownish color of most lobsters is a useful adaptation that allows them to blend into their surroundings and hide better than, uh, from predators. An adaptation is a trait that helps an organism survive in its environment.
So here's a normal DNA molecule, lobster with typical coloring. And here's a mutation, the DNA molecule with mutation, lobster with blue coloring. Scientists can study an organism's karyotype, which is the number, form, and size of all of an organism's chromosomes. Scientists use a karyotype to identify and evaluate the size, shape, and numbers of chromosomes in a sample of body cells. Scientists can organize an organism's chromosomes in a karyogram, a visual representation of an organism's complete set of chromosomes, arranged in pairs and in a numbered sequence according to the size and the position of the centromeres. The centromere is the part of the chromosome that links the individual chromosomes within a pair. In humans, the first 22 chromosomes pairs are the autosomes, which are chromosomes that everyone has. They are numbered according to size. The gender-specific sex chromosomes are the final chromosome pair. Biological females have an XX combination, and biological males have an XY combination. Studying karyotypes and karyograms is important for scientists interested in the structure of cells, as well as the study of heredity and genetics. For example, scientists can sometimes see mutations that are known to sometimes cause various illnesses. This karyogram shows a human male's chromosomes. Section two, cells grow and divide. The bristle cone pine. There is a tree in the White Mountains of California that scientists believe is more than 5,000 years old. This tree, a bristle cone pine, is the oldest known individual tree in the world. Scientists who are interested in the long lifespan of the bristle cone pine have compared seeds and pollen from bristle cone pines of different ages. They found that the cells of the old trees appear just as young as the cells of the younger trees. No one really understands how the bristlecone pine can live so long. This is something scientists are continuing to study. But scientists know it has something to do with the life cycle of the tree's cells. A life cycle is the series of developmental stages an organism passes through on its way from birth to death. The lifespan of a cell ranges from one day to more than 100 years. As cells follow a similar pattern of development, all cells first grow, and then they divide to produce new daughter cells, which are cells formed by the division of a parent cell. Those daughter cells contain DNA from the parent cell. This ordered series of events, which moves from growth to division, is called the cell cycle. This photograph shows a grove of bristlecone pines. These trees are some of the longest living trees in the world. The growing phase. A typical animal cell cycle lasts roughly 24 hours, although in some animal cells it lasts less than eight hours. While in other kinds of cells, it takes more than a year. The majority of the cell cycle is spent in interphase, the period of time when a cell performs its normal functions. For example, a human muscle cell contracts and relaxes during interphase, enabling you to move. Interphase is also when the cell grows, nearly doubling its size. Finally, DNA is replicated during interphase. To replicate means to make a copy of. DNA structure allows it to replicate because each strand of the double helix runs in opposite directions. Before a cell divides, the twisted, tightly packed double helix unwinds and separates its two strands, unzipping down the middle. Each strand serves as a template for a new strand of DNA. New nucleotides are added to each unzipped strand of the DNA molecule. Adenine pairs with thymine and guanine pairs with cytosine. The two new strands are both exact replicas of the original DNA molecule. The two identical chromosomes that result from DNA replication are referred to as sister chromatids. They are linked together by the centromere. 
the chromosomes are not visible during interphase. Here's the cell cycle. And here we see the chromosomes before replication, the centromeres, chromosomes after replication with sister chromatids. The dividing phase. Once a cell has replicated its DNA, it gets ready to divide so it can pass along its genetic information to its offspring. Cell division refers to the splitting of a single cell into daughter cells, each with DNA from the parent cell. Cell division is a natural part of a cell's life cycle, so all cells have proteins that can tell them when to divide. Once DNA replication happens in a prokaryotic cell, a new membrane forms that will eventually divide the cell, including the duplicated DNA, in two. This process happens quickly. For example, in ideal conditions, the life cycle of bacteria occurs every 30 minutes. The eukaryotic life cycle is more complex than the prokaryotic life cycle because eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes within a nucleus. Most plant and animal cells take between 10 and 20 hours to double in number, while some duplicate much more slowly. For example, human skin cells divide almost constantly, while nerve cells in adult animals almost never divide. There are several reasons why cells divide. One important reason is growth. The more cells an organism has, the larger that organism is. For example, humans start off as a single cell. By the time they are adults, they have trillions of cells. Almost all of those cells, with the exception of eggs, sperms, and red blood cells, contain the same copy of DNA because of DNA replication and cell division. Cell division also allows, allows cells to repair damaged cells or replace dead cells. For example, human skin cells constantly divide so they can replace damaged or dead skin cells. Muscle cells also divide frequently to replace cells damaged by exercise or injury. Cell division allows cells to repair damaged cells. Cell division through mitosis. Wounds heal and organisms grow through mitosis. Mitosis is a form of cell division that results in two daughter cells, each with the same number and kind of chromosomes as the parent cell. Cells that undergo mitosis create exact replicas of themselves. There are four phases of mitosis. Phase one, prophase. When the cell is ready to divide, DNA is wrapped even more tightly and the chromosomes become visible. Each chromosome consists of the two sister chromatids formed during replication. The nuclear membrane breaks down and the chromosomes are freed from the nucleus. Small fibers called spindle fibers begin to grow from the centrosomes on opposite sides of the cell and attach to each sister chromatid at its centromere. Phase two, metaphase. During metaphase, the chromosome pairs line up in the middle of the cell, end to end. This formation ensures that each daughter cell will receive one copy of each chromosome. Phase three, anaphase. The separation begins. The sister chromatids separate and the spindle fibers pull one complete set of an organism's chromosomes to each end of the cell. For humans, 46 chromosomes move to each end of the cell. Each side receives the same number and kind of chromosomes as the parent cell. Phase four, telophase. During telophase, the chromosomes reach opposite ends of the cell. Nuclear envelopes reassemble and enclose each cell's set of chromosomes in a nucleus. The chromosomes become indistinct again. After telophase, most cells undergo a process called cytokinesis, in which the rest of the cell splits apart resulting in two separate daughter cells. So here's a picture of the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Mitosis in plants and animals. Cells move through each of the four phases of mitosis relatively quickly. 
prophase is generally the longest phase of mitosis because so much has to happen. The nuclear membrane has to break down and the spindle fibers have to attach to each chromosome. Metaphase is a relatively short phase because just one thing has to happen. The chromosomes line up at the center of the cell. Metaphase is followed by anaphase, which is the shortest phase of mitosis because it does not take long for the chromosomes to be pulled to opposite ends of the cell. Telophase is another short phase as a new nuclear membrane begins to form around the chromosomes in each half of the cell. In plants and animals, mitosis happens frequently. This is because plants and animals begin life as a single cell. Through mitosis, that single cell divides many times, becoming many cells that all have the same copy of genetic information. Mitosis is how individual plants and animals grow and develop. For example, an onion's roots grow as they search for water and nutrients. Onion cells generally require 12 hours for one complete cell cycle, moving from interphase through the four phases of mitosis and back to interphase. So animal cells, and this is a hookworm, undergoing mitosis. Interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And then here is a plant cell, this is an onion root, undergoing mitosis. Interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Section three, reproduction. The peacock spider. One day, a scientist named Jurgen Otto went for a walk in the woods when he noticed an unusual tiny jumping spider. Otto is a scientist who studies insects, so he was particularly interested in the nimbleness of the spider, called a peacock spider. Otto became intrigued by the spider and researched it. He learned that not a lot was known about the spider, so he began to study it. After a couple of years, he documented something no one had seen before. The male peacock spider performs an elaborate dance that includes hopping, waving its legs, and vibrating its abdomen. The spider also raises a colorful fan-like flap during the dance. Scientists believe that the male spider's dance is so elaborate and its fan so colorful for a reason. It is trying to attract a female. An elaborate dance and a vibrant, colorful fan are adaptations that indicate to the potential female mate that the male has good genes. This is important to the female who wants to produce offspring with the same good genes. A driving force behind all life is the urge to reproduce and pass along genes to future offspring. Reproduction is the ability of a mature organism to have offspring. When organisms reproduce, their DNA gets passed along to their offspring. This is why children resemble their parents in different ways. There are two types of reproduction, sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. The peacock spider uses sexual reproduction, which combines the genetic information of two parents of different sexes to create a new individual or individuals. So here's a picture of a male peacock spider. sexual reproduction. Multi-celled organisms, such as the peacock spider, use a sexual reproduction strategy called fertilization. Fertilization is the fusion of two gametes, one from a male and the other from a female, to produce a new organism. Gametes are cells that only contain half of an organism's chromosomes. When two gametes combine, they create a new individual that has a complete set of chromosomes. Gametes are created by another form of cell division that takes place in eukaryotic cells called meiosis, during which the cell divides twice, once in meiosis one and once in meiosis two. The result is four daughter cells, each with half the chromosome number of the parent cell. Meiosis only happens in cells that are preparing for reproduction. Just as in mitosis, the chromosomes must duplicate before meiosis can take place. The same four phases of mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase occur during both meiosis I and meiosis II. 
However, there are a few key differences at various steps in the process. One significant difference in meiosis is that the non-sister chromatics exchange genetic information. This is called crossing over, and it occurs at random places along the chromosomes. This is an important difference from mitosis because it results in chromosomes that have different genetic information from the parent chromosomes. Another key difference is that the nucleus divides twice, which produces four daughter cells. So here's a diagram of non-sister chromatics exchanging genetic information. And here we're seeing how mitosis produces two identical daughter cells. Meiosis produces four daughter cells that are genetically different from one another. Results of mitosis, results of meiosis. By the end of meiosis, there are four daughter cells which are the gametes because they have just half of the chromosomes as the parent cell, and they are genetically different from the parent cell and from each other. When fertilization occurs, the gametes from the male and the female join together, forming a cell that has a complete set of chromosomes, one half from each parent. Human males produce gametes called sperm. Human females produce gametes called eggs. When a sperm and egg fuse together, they form an embryo. The embryo grows into a complete human being. In flowering plants, pollen is the male gamete and the ovule is the female gamete. Fertilization is common for multi-celled organisms. The most common sexual reproduction strategy for single-celled organisms is conjugation. Paramecians conjugate by forming a bridge between two cells. A donor cell transfers its genetic information over the bridge which then becomes a part of the receiving cell's DNA. There are some advantages to sexual reproduction. For example, because each offspring has a different set of traits, certain individuals have a greater advantage over threats than others. This isn't true with asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction requires only one parent. Because of this, the offspring of an asexually reproducing organism possess nearly all the same genes as their parent. Some differences happen as a result of genetic mutations during the DNA replication. Asexual reproduction. The most common strategy for prokaryote reproduction is splitting in half. This is called fission and it is similar but not the same as mitosis because prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. The single-celled parent divides into two or more daughter cells of equal size. The daughter cells grow in size and then also divide. Some eukaryotic organisms, such as paramecium, also use fission to split in half. Yeast are single-celled fungi that reproduce asexually by budding. A bud appears on the parent cell and receives nutrients from the parent until it is fully mature. The bud then breaks off and becomes a unique individual with the same genes as its parent. Fragmentation is another form of asexual reproduction where a new individual develops from a part of a parent that broke off and regenerated into a complete organism. Some sea stars and flatworms can reproduce this way. Asexual reproduction is common in organisms with very short life cycles and with species that need dense populations to overcome predation and other threats. The problem with asexual reproduction is that if a parent organism cannot survive in a changing environment, neither will any of its offspring. The exception is when, of, is one, is when one of the offspring has a mutation that allows it to better survive. These mutations often lead to new types of organisms. So here's a picture of fission. And here is fragmentation. Reproductive strategies, asexual reproduction, binary fission, budding, fragmentation. Here's another picture of fragmentation sexual reproduction, conjugation, fertilization. Asexual or sexual? 
there are some organisms that are able to reproduce both asexually and sexually, including sea stars, sponges, mushrooms, and paramecians. Sea stars can reproduce through fertilization, with male sea stars releasing sperm and females releasing eggs into the environment. When a sperm joins with an egg, it forms a free-floating embryo that will eventually grow into an adult that has genetic material from both the male and the female. However, sometimes part of a sea star's arm and central disc become detached from the rest of the body. In certain cases, this detached portion can grow into another organism that is genetically identical to the original sea star. The ability to reproduce both asexually and sexually offers organisms the benefits of both kinds of reproduction. For example, being able to reproduce asexually eliminates the need for finding a mate and ensures all of an organism's genes get passed along to offspring, which is beneficial for organisms that are already well adapted to their environment. As a result, asexual reproduction is much more efficient than sexual reproduction, which requires time and energy. However, sexual reproduction ensures genetic variation, which increases the likelihood that some individuals will be able to survive challenging environments. For example, the paramecium is a unicellular eukaryote that alternates between asexual and sexual reproduction. It mostly reproduces asexually by fission. The organism divides, splitting in two by pinching off in the middle. The ideal conditions, in ideal conditions, a paramecium can reproduce asexually two or three times a day. However, if the environment becomes stressful, such as when, is there, that when there is overcrowding or scarce food, Paramecium will begin to reproduce sexually by conjugation. Two paramecium will join together and exchange genetic information. Here's a picture of paramecium reproducing by conjugation. And here's a picture of paramecium reproducing by fission. Planarians. The Giardia doratocephala is a species of planarian a flatworm native to the Americas. All flatworms in the planarian family are simple invertebrates, animals without backbones. They live in fresh water or under leaves and stones. Planarians are nocturnal carnivores that eat other small invertebrates, such as pill bugs, caddisflies, and snails. A flatworm eats its prey by extending a tube-like mouth from the middle of its body and secreting digestive juices. It then sucks in the partially digested food. Planarians have the amazing ability to regenerate parts of their body. If you cut one of these flatworms, the two halves will grow into two new whole organisms with the same genetic pattern. In nature, planarians use this process called fragmentation as a way of reproducing asexually. A planarian will attach the bottom portion of its body to a rock or solid surface and then pull the top part of its body away, leaving behind a body fragment. A planarian body fragment, 1 279th, the size of a fully grown planarian, can regenerate into a new planarian. Fully regenerated planarians have eye spots. Planarians can regenerate so easily because 20 to 30% of their cells are neoblasts. When a planarian is injured, neoblasts migrate to the site and begin dividing through mitosis. Neoblasts can become any cell the planarian needs. Planarians also reproduce sexually. Planarians use hermaphroditic, um, planarians are hermaphroditic, possess both male and female sex organs, but they cannot self-fertilize. Once a planarian's egg is fertilized, the egg is transferred outside the planarian's body to its environment. The egg case takes a few weeks to hatch. Planarians have a simple sensory system with two eye spots called photoreceptors that can detect light and nerve cells that travel from the head to the rest of the body. Planarians will avoid or swim away from light. In the lab, eyes that are fully regenerated on planarian body fragments can be observed with a high power magnifier. You can also test the photoreceptor eyes by shining a beam of light onto the planarian fragment. The distance that the planarian moves away from the light 
will be greatest when the photoreceptors are fully functioning. In the lab, it's important that you use spring water for your planarians. The spring water should be changed at least once a week if it looks cloudy. Planarians prefer to be kept in cool, dark places. Do not try to feed planarians after they have been cut or fragmented. Here's a picture of a fully grown planarian with visible photoreceptors or eyes. And here's a planarian body fragment regenerating into a fully grown planarian. I learned a lot reading cell division, and I hope that you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with another one. Bye.